We have Dr. Scott Moody, an associate professor emeritus. He's technically retired now, for those of you that don't know what that means. Um, but I'm pretty sure he's here all the time, like most of us. Um, he's going to be talking about Athens 240 years ago, a natural history. He's from biological science. Welcome, Scott. Let's first hear from, for those of you who saw the flyer with me holding a sandhill crane, yes, that sandhill crane stopped here in Athens spring of 2017. I had a phone call, several phone calls and emails from people desperate for me to come pick it up because it was walking down East State Street. Now, I've been here 40 years. Uh, my predecessor, Hank Siebert, uh, was here from uh, starting in 1947. Sandhill Cranes had never been documented in Athens, Ohio, before. That's their, what they look like, their interesting call. I grew up with them out, out in Nebraska. But the reason I chose that photo, not only because it was just kind of a neat photo to use to advertise this talk, you're going to be very surprised in a few minutes as to the first European American to have seen sandhill cranes in the area. And it was in 1770. And I only, through preparing for this talk, discovered that fact last week, which was pre pretty neat. So, okay, let's get to the... Got to shut it down. So as... As most of you know, I'm a, I'm a naturalist, have been, been a naturalist ever since I was a little kid. So I'm always out outdoors and discovering things. The other po poster flyer that went around shows me with a white oak tree that I discovered at the end of August. I was out uh, monitoring for timber rattlesnakes and found this monster seven feet in diameter, which makes it 300 plus years, most, most likely. Now, there are a few in, the, in eastern, south, southern Ohio that are a little bit bigger, but it's a rarity for anyone ever to see such a tree. Okay, the person I'm channeling right now is a name that you should all be familiar with, Dr. Manessa Cutler. Cutler, Cutler Hall, back over there. The person who had the idea to set up this university. He never was here at this site, but his son was a board of trustees of, of Ohio University back in the early 1800s. But it was Cutler's vision that uh, brought the European Americans to this area because he set up the Ohio Holding Company in order for the Revolutionary War officers to be paid, and all, none of them were paid, they were given land in the Ohio territories. So that's why I'm in costume. This is a typical New England Revolutionary War uh, officer's outfit. I have 12, I've documented 12 great, 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 great grandfathers of my various lineages who served in the American Revolutionary War. Um, so this is what they would have been wearing at that time. Why did I pick 240 years? That's 1788. Dr. Cutler, packed a small horse carriage in Ipwich, Massachusetts, 
and headed off to Marietta. 751 miles, 29 days. Now, I have done that same trip numerous times, and I'll do it in a day, a long day, about 14, 15 hours from here to Boston. But can you imagine a trip in 1788? And you saw that one seven-foot tree. He went by thousands of trees of that same, same size. He was probably, could have been wearing his coat from the Revolutionary War. He certainly probably was wearing very similar clothing uh, underneath as I'm wearing now. Uh, Tricornered hats made of beaver felt were quite common at that point in time, and we'll come back to, to beavers and pelts in a few minutes. So, let's, let's see if my mouse is still working. Yeah. So, natural history of Athens, 240 years ago. And perhaps uh, Dr. Cutler, but certainly a lot of the other settlers who were coming in after the Revolutionary War, I mean, they saw lots of rattlesnakes, they saw lots of hellbenders, they saw wood rats living in the, the, uh, the geological overhangs in the hills, and spadefoot toads, and muskalungi, musky fish this big, and bald eagles, and now we know sandhill cranes, and beavers, and bison, and elk, and wolves, and bears, and Oh my, lots of wildlife that we don't see here anymore. So over the last 40 years, you know, as I've done a, a variety of things, a lot of different types of te teaching and research, but the call to go out and hike around the area and, and understand the, the history of the area has always been a passion of mine. And I always want to, to uh, give thanks to two individuals who were very influential on me getting to know this area since I didn't grow up in the, in the Midwest. Marilyn Ort, who was a naturalist with ODNR and really knew the plants and ecological habitats in the area. And Andy Ora Anderson, uh, who was uh, a key person with the Nature Conservancy and saved the dairy barn and so on. So my thanks to them for pointing out what I'm going to emphasize tonight because it's something that most of the rest of the community, and I'm talking both at the state and federal level, those who are responsible for our natural resources, down to local folks, something that's being overlooked as we try to protect our natural heritage. Now back uh, 16, 14, 16 years ago, David McCullough was our uh, commencement speaker. So how many of you were there? Testing the old faculty here. <laughs> I was there. Uh, and the reason why uh, McCullough was asked to give the commencement talk was because he had just uh, published the Wright Brothers. And so he had been in Ohio quite a bit and got to know quite a bit about the uh, Ohio history. But he's also well known for writing 1776, the first year of the American Revolution, and then a few years later uh, wrote, wrote uh, John Adams. If you really want to understand the beginning of, of our country, the United States of America, John Adams is, is a must book to read. But McCullough himself has said that with all his research, bringing him into Ohio, using the archives over in Alden Library, using the archives at Marietta College, because Marietta was, was the first of the, the set settlements, he, it was only then that he began to realize the impact of the officers of the Revolutionary War and the setting up of the Northwest Territories, the land that the United States obtained from defeating Great Britain at the end of the Revolutionary War. So all the states between the Ohio River and the Mississippi River, so we're talking about Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio. 
as part of the Northwest ter Territory. As he began to realize this importance and particularly the brilliance of the vision of Dr. Manasseh Cutler, he said, he's got to write a book about it. And so he's, he's 84 years old and probably not cranking out the books as, as fast as he would like. But next spring, 2019, he's going to, to uh, release the new book called The Pioneers. Unfortunately, there have been a number of other authors writing books, The Pioneers. A lot of times when you're thinking of pioneers, you're thinking about the, the uh, Oregon Trail or the uh, Mormon Trail. But these were the pioneers from New England, the officers, many of them were uh, Ivy League college educated, Harvard, Dartmouth, uh, Yale, Brown, Prin Princeton, uprooting from their homes in New England and traveling to Marietta and Athens and so on. And so he, this is the book that's gonna be launched. I've been in, given, uh, indirectly giving him a lot of ideas uh, over the last couple of years in correspondence with his research assistant. Uh, my, my input was trying to get him to describe accurately the natural areas uh, found around here. Let's skip over those are just the maps of the Northwest Territory. Some of the uh, early individuals that, that came, came in af after Cutler visited in 1788. He did not move here. He stayed in Ipswich. He's still bur and buried in Ipswich. His son, Ephraim, did come and settled in Belpre. But there are others, the very, very important, like Thomas Ewing. Uh, he, Thomas was the son of George Ewing, a lieutenant in the Revolutionary War, who was one of the first settlers out uh, in the Federal Creek area of Amesville. Thomas Ewing, unfortunately, some of the websites will say he was the first graduate of Ohio University. It's not, not true, he was the second, but he was in the first class. Uh, but the, in terms of numbering them, the person with the better grades got to be number one. He had the second best grades. So, uh, so if you ever see that, Thomas Ewing was first graduate, no, he was second graduate. Some unknown individual with the last name of Hunter was the first, nobody's ever heard of him. So, but uh, the first professor and president of Ohio University was Jacob Lindley. He was a graduate of Princeton College and he came out mainly to settle on the, on the lands of the, and then was asked to come down from Washington County to uh, run our college. Three students, one president, one who was also the one professor. The second professor three years later was Artemis Sawyer, a graduate of Harvard 1798 and came here predominantly to teach the courses in, in rhetoric, argumentation, and law. And what was interesting was I discovered that he was the grand nephew of one of my Revolutionary War Patriots, Ephraim Sawyer. So uh, I only f discovered that last, last spring. So here's, here's Manasseh Cutler, uh, a, a uh, oil painting of him, who was the, the initiator, the, the brains behind the whole op operation. So when you had kind of a, oh, I think there was about 160, 180 settlers in Athens County in the, in the um, 1790s. The university had, wasn't yet founded. It was organized uh, in 1804. But remember, a lot, many of these individuals were highly educated from these colleges in New England. And they definitely wanted books to read. There was no library, there was no, no public library, no university. And they organized the first circulating library in Ohio by pooling resources. Now they didn't have money, currency was a rare sort of thing, 
but they all decided we'll all go hunting and trapping and we're going to sell the pelts and buy books. And it turned out that at that point, and I will come back to this in a minute, a lot of the mammals that had valuable skins, actually in the 1790s, most of them were already gone. The trapping in the, before the French and Indian War was so intense that bears and wolves and, be and beaver were pretty much absent. The one animal that was still fairly common was one that you are familiar with, because you see them run over on the roads, or if you drive through Athens in the middle of the night, you see them coming out of the, out of the, um, the sewer drains, but the raccoon. So they accumulated uh, several hundred pelts, a few bear, some deer, uh, but mostly raccoon, but who would buy raccoon pelts around here? You'd go get your own raccoon pelt. But they were of value further east. So one of the first settlers, Captain Brown, uh, Benjamin Brown, uh, his son Samuel packed all the furs up into a wagon and just like Manasseh Cutler several years earlier, he did the reverse journey, took a wagon full of pelts all the way to Boston. It got a good price for, for them, $74. But that was enough to buy uh, about a, an equivalent number of books and encyclopedias. And that library is still out in Amesville, the Coonskin Library. It's a, at the, uh, located at the elementary school. Um, so we're talking about very well-educated individuals of desire for uh, setting up a, a place of, of education. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, just, just imagine we're out, outdoors, we're walking through the forest, we're walking through marshes and, and so on. Most people are only paying attention to what they see, but are you really seeing everything? If you're a bird watcher, yeah, you gotta see the bird, but most bird watchers identify birds by listening. You listen for, for them. Hearing is very important. But how many of you have actually gotten down in your hands and knees and crawled for a half mile through a woods or a swamp and get, get to know things up close and really appreciate the smells and tastes and all the the amazing little little things. Most of you, since you're coming to this talk, probably do enjoy going out in, in nature and outdoors and hiking the trails at Zalaski, uh, Dow, um, Strouds Run, Dow, Dow Lake, and so on. And and you enjoy seeing the tr trees and. Is that what Manasseh Cutler saw 240 years ago? Uh, and unfortunately, not. Um, so, you know, imagine right now, close your eyes and imagine it's 1788. What are you going to see? What are you going to hear? What are you going to smell? What critters are you going to be always wanting to look over your shoulder to make sure that you're uh, not going to become a meal or, or something? Um, so things were quite a bit different, and what Manasseh Cutler saw as he came across Pennsylvania, uh, put his, um, his uh, uh, sulky on a, on a flat bottom boat and floated down from Pittsburgh to Mar Marietta, he saw huge trees like, like the tree that I uh, met mentioned earlier. So several years ago, Gene Bax uh, edited Ohio's Wild History and made the point that frontier Ohio's blend of habitats where the primeval forest and all these big trees mingled with patches of grassland that foretold of the vast prairies to the west. And the western half of Ohio has a lot of these remnant prairies, which is excellent far farmland e even today. The wealth of the rivers and streams framed by the great freshwater lake and beautiful river provided even more natural treasure. The early people coming in 
especially noted crossing the rivers, like the Muskingum River from Marietta up through uh, Zanesville, New Concord, Newark. The Muskingum River teemed with monster muskalungus, the musky fish, 40 pound fish that, uh, that you could see throughout. Uh, and most importantly, and what most people never think about around here, when you're walking the, along the Hawking River, how many of you have found big, huge clam shells? A few. Most people would say, well, what, why is there a clam shell here? Most people associate clams with the ocean. Well, it turns out that the Midwest is a, has an incredible biodiversity of freshwater clams, the native the Native Americans relied heavily on these freshwater clams. We're talking about big, big, I mean, one of these would make a nice meal for an individual. And so the early, early pioneers also realized that uh, this, this was a, a good source of food. And when you handle it, it's, it's like, like pearl, it's a very hard shell. Uh, and unfortunately, I think I'm going to replace my buttons because I keep popping buttons off my vest. Uh, I found recently a box full of buttons made out of freshwater clams. So probably to be more realistic, I need to replace, replace my buttons. So the next time you're walking down, I mean, they're, they're up, up and down. The diversity here in Ohio is, is, is great. And there's, there's a picture of a very large mu muskie. Another uh, group of animals that, that were quite noticeable for the early pioneers that came in here, particularly in the late winter and spring and summer, would be the constant din, symphony, just loud environment of frogs and toads calling. We still have them today, but can you imagine back then when the forest hadn't yet been cut down and the rivers hadn't been channelized and carrying a heavy load of silt and other toxic chem chemicals, uh, amphibians had to have been a, an incredibly dominant organism. So at the end, after I'm done talking, we've got a variety of, of frogs and salamanders that you can look for in here. The first person to actually have written about the natural history of this area was a Moravian. This is a, a he was German, but in a part of what's now Czechia or the Czech Republic, part that's known as Moravia, but that was a major German settlement in the 1600s, 1700s. But the Moravians uh, were, were, uh, had adopted a, uh, a form of Protestantism, not, not exactly Lutheranism, but they also, many of them moved to, the, to Pennsylvania uh, to practice their, their particular religious interpretations. And several of them came to Ohio in the 1760s to uh, provide uh, missionary work to the Indians, Native Americans. And so some of you may have been through the, the Ohio Historical Society's Schoenbrunn Museum, uh, Nodenhuten Memorial up, up uh, past uh, uh, Cambridge, Ohio. Uh, but one of the neatest things was that Zeisberger provided one of the first good um, descriptive reports of how the Native Americans lived, what they ate, all their different rituals and habits and, and, and so on. And he made a lot of natural history observations as well. So the first one I want to talk, talk about is the Eastern Diamond Rattlesnake. And here's a couple from Athens County in this, this jar. A very large rattlesnake that was once very, very common around. Uh, but the pioneers coming out of New England, they would have been familiar with the snake because New England has, also has timber rattlesnakes. But Zeisberger state, states that there 
uh, yellow in color, marked with black spots, the largest are four feet long, uh, rattles at the end of the tail, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. So a good observer, he was paying attention to what's happening. He even described how the fangs are erected and, and so on. And as, I, as you read through his diaries, all of his observations are spot on, uh, which, which I've noted for a number of years, but this is the first time I've, I've put all this together in, in a talk. So for example, this is my colleague, uh, Doug Wynn, who's basically Mr. Rattlesnake for Ohio. Um, all of this shaded part of Ohio had timber rattlesnakes. So basically the northern part along Lake Erie, the eastern half, the, the southern half, the only part that would, did not have timber rattlesnakes is this uh, glaciated, the flat prairie areas and black swamp. But there's a second rattlesnake that's predominant there. The dark areas indicate where the timber rattlesnake is extinct. So today there's only just a, a pocket full of, or several pocket's of population found, inclu including a, a few here in a Athens ca County. So as the woods were chopped down, uh, farmland uh, was initiated and people were afraid of this large snake and so there'd be rattlesnake roundups uh, to kill off the rat rattlesnakes, which is unfortunate. It's not that dangerous of a snake if you know their, know their behavior. Yeah. In order what? to give some context, what was the last record reported for rattlesnake seen in Athens? Well, there was a rattlesnake reported in Athens? Uh, 19, it's either 88 or 89, because I saw them. Yeah. But they're still here. Uh, we've got a small population within half mile of the Athens border. Uh, just to let, let you know, those of you who travel US 33, take the Nelsonville bypass. And you look over and see this little fine bent over fence. And so well, what's that fence for? That's awfully short. Deer can just jump right over that. Well, yeah, that fence isn't for the deer. It's for the rattlesnakes <laughs> to keep them into the, in the woods instead of going onto the highway. So another, another uh, animal that was reported by one of, one of the other Moravians, Heckledelder, was traveling up the Muskingum River, uh, moving some of the Indian settlers. So it's April 25th, 1773. And so they, just, they stopped along the Muskingum River. So this is about halfway between Marietta and um, McConnellsville in Morgan County. And so they camp and they provide enough of a description in the diary that we can actually go in and know exactly where they were at. Well, note what, what he says here. This night we did not find much rest because of the vast number of toads. Now that's a translation from the German. And he did say Kroten, which is German for toads which greatly annoyed us. The Lenape Indians, a Delaware tribe, called this place, and I don't know how they would say that, but the Indians themselves called it the town of the toads. And about midnight, we had a terrible thunderstorm accompanied by heavy rain, and these toads swept out and were coming through the campground and so on. Well, this individual, this was, he wrote this up in 1952 and went to uh, the state zoologist, the Ohio State zoologist, and they determined that these were spring peepers. Uh, most of you know the little, little spring peeper, beep, 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 beep. Um, 
That would not be a sound that would greatly annoy because it's quite musical. Plus, it's also April 25th, and most spring peepers, are, their big choruses are in the February, Mar March, maybe early April. But as I was looking at this paper a couple of weeks ago and, and wh where they had camped right here is a, you can see the Muskingum River making a big turn here. Anytime a river turns and you can walk down, walk along the Hawking River, you can see where it makes a turn. On the inside of a turn, it will drop lots of sand and gravel. And actually, even today, there's a huge gravel sand pit right, right there. And this was an area that I had predicted should have spadefoot toads. And I actually verified that in 2002. <laughs> so what these Moravian missionaries and their Indians had found was what we now, it's the only frog toad in Ohio that, that is, that is uh, in, endangered. And when, it, when you have a big heavy rain, they all come out of the, the woods and they just stream down to the floodplain area and uh, that's, that's where they're going to breed. And if we've got enough time, let me play their call. Come on. Next. Well, it's not going to go. At the, at the end, I'll pull up the call, but it's, it is very, very loud, and it is uh, rather disturbing. So because of their ideal description, natural history description, we don't now really know what's, what's going on. So we're going to go through a big, big transition. Uh, the trappers, fur trappers had been in the area well before the Revolutionary War. The Native Americans were trapping extensively to trade pelts to get black powder and musket rifles and steel axes from a trade with the British and the, the French. So 1750 to 1800 is a big transition period in terms of the habitats and the, the uh, various animals uh, occupying here. So most of Ohio is covered by forest. A lot of the natural history descriptions focuses on forest, but you also have to realize that low-lying uh, low areas along rivers and lakes are going to be filled with marshes and swamps and wet and tall grass prairies, wild plum prairies, up Bowling Green, get the flat Bowling Green area areas. So, but then you get into eastern and southern Ohio, which is unglaciated uh, and very hilly. You're going to get a mixture of chestnuts and oaks. And, uh, but along the rivers, these riverine corridors, and pre-glacial river distribution, the Taze River, left behind big broad valleys where there's no river today, but it's still flat and very, very wet. This was the area that the Native Americans had been utilizing for two, three thousand years in maintaining the, the uh, grassland prairie by burning it. And that would regenerate good grass so that they would have plenty of, of big game to hunt. And we're not talking about just white-tailed deer that we see, see today. I mean, that's a fairly large buck. What was common, right, even here in the Hawking River Valley, this is just one antler of an elk. An elk is a, is a relative of the deer, but many times larger. So one elk is going to be, provide enough meat for uh, supplying a, a family. You think of the American bison as being uh, a denizen of the, the Great Plains out west. Uh, yes, there were millions more out there, but Ohio had thousands of bison, and they were right here 
in the Hawking River Valley as well. So we think of the forest as being the only natural habitat, but a large amount of the natural habitat for this area was all this tall, wet grass prairie uh, up and down the, uh, the rivers. Um, now in terms of, eh, come on back. In terms of any woodland that's close to being virginal, I pulled up uh, several that's within driving distance. Or uh, Dysart Woods, which Ohio University maintains, is two hours away up in Belmont. Uh, Morgan Sisters Woods is down in Gallia County. And Hawkwoods, you can, you know, 20 minute walk and you can get up to that. It's just off East, East State Street. And then there's a few other nice little, so if you go to one of these old growth uh, forests, one of the things you'll notice is not only just big trees and, you, and usually the absence of invasive uh, plants that you don't want in there, but when you get a chance to visit, go walking through and kind of bounce up and down on the soils. What makes an old growth woods is thick, thick, two, three, four meters thick of humus and organic mat matter, and a nice, nice topsoil. So when the first settlers came in, they cut it all down uh, for, uh, for building their homes to make uh, farmland, come on, to, Come on, there. So uh, they cut down all these nice old trees and burned off lo logs so that from the time that Manasseh Cutler walked down here in 1788 and 40 years later, 50 years later, most of Southeast Ohio looked like that. It looked like an atom bomb had gone off. Uh, cut, the, cut the woods down for for fields, for, for um, making charcoal, and then they discovered coal seams and then dug, dug that up as, as well. So before that, soil erosion was at a minimum. Uh, anytime it would rain, like the three inches of rain we got earlier on, on Monday from the uh, hurricane, the Hawking River today is several feet higher than it was on Monday because all that rain just washed off and went into the river. If that would have happened 240 years ago, the river wouldn't have even changed because the ground was just this big sponge and held all, all the, the water and released it slowly. So there was springs everywhere. I've got uh, a set of old topographical maps for, for this area of Ohio that were done in the 1905. And they're marked with all the known springs. Most of those springs don't flow with water any, anymore. Um, come on, machine. So that's been a, a major impact. If you read the, the big book, Fishes of Ohio by Dr. Troutman, he uh, went and found a lot of the early naturalist descriptions of water and the rivers and the fish. 1848, uh, Hildreth was pointing out that the rivers were constantly being supplied by springs that ran 12 months of the year. Kramer in 1880, 18, uh, made reference to all the different habitats of a river that would allow for the fish to, to, to uh, breed. And other accounts would point out the huge amount of fish in the rivers. You could take a boat down the river and actually see the bottom of the river. There was no sediment. The water was, was clear. Um, and all that's, that's gone now. So here, I'm not sure why that's, 
Here's another observation by Zeisberger. How many have ever seen a Cryptobranchus, Alleghenyensis, a Hellbender? This I have argued for years should be the, the real mascot of Ohio University, not the bobcat, because it's North America's largest salamander. And it's beautiful. And they used to be common in the Hocking River. And right now it's, it's uh, heavily uh, endangered. We've got some, uh, some uh, projects at several zoos that the Ohio University students have been involved with in reintroducing, head-starting juveniles and reintroducing them into creeks that are still clean, clean enough, but the silt. So we have, we have, if you go down to the rocks at, at uh, White's Mill, that's where they had been collected 100, 100 years ago, 50 year, years ago. And look what uh, Zeisberger says. A uh, variety of fish resembles a small catfish, but has, has legs, uh, you know, obviously not. Okay. Uh, let me scroll through things that uh, will be of interest to you. I've got to answer the question on the Sandhill Crane. 1770, did you know that George Washington visited Athens County? Up and down the, up and down the Ohio River surveying. How many of you wondered why Baker Center downstairs, there's a latitude 39 and a and a West uh, 82 food court. Why those particular numbers? Well, look at our latitude longitude coordinates. George Washington had worked all that out. And so we have records of where he camped along the Ohio River and, and next to the Hawking River and the Little Hawking River. But what I found a couple of weeks ago was this interesting note in his diary. October 30th, he explored Kanawha River, about 10 miles upriver from the Ohio, so that's up, up into West Virginia from uh, Gallipolis. Went hunting, killed three buffalo and three deer. This country abounds in buffalo and wild game of all kinds. Saw birds in size between a goose and a swan. The cry of these was as unusual as the bird itself. So that's the bird I played at the beginning. He would have been familiar from Eastern Virginia of any large bird, turkeys, hawks, eagles, water birds. He would not have known anything about sandhill cranes. And so it's quite clear that he was seeing sandhill cranes. So, uh, Things have changed. Passenger pigeons gone extinct. Uh, wild turkeys went extinct and were brought back into the state. Uh, nut trees, uh, fewer and fewer big nut trees were out, out there. The uh, poor little pack rat or, or uh, wood rat, nearly there's only a few of them left. Uh, point I would like to make, the yellow shows all of the tall grass prairie floodplains of, of Athens, Ohio. Half the town is floodplain, and, and we should be planting prairie grasses along there instead of trees. Uh, true trees that grow along the rivers are eh, things like sycamore, box elder, cottonwoods. Go over by the uh, swimming pool and hug one of those big uh, cottonwood wood trees. Mammoths were here, bison were here. I've got a mammoth tooth up here, a bison skull, uh, elk uh, antler, all of it. black bears were in here. I've got a black bear skull up, up here. Panthers or cougars were here. I do not have a skull of one of those. Bobcats, yeah. But how many universities have bobcats as their mascot? You know? Uh, Eastern gray wolves were common around here. We've got a skin of a, of a gray wolf. Uh, beavers, beavers is what um, really did, made the big altering around was these beaver hats. 
and beaver felt hats were very popular and the pelts look at how much a beaver pelt six dollars a pound whereas a deer skin would be only 27 cents no wonder they went extinct um, so again i'm putting in a plug i wasn't able to build up to the crescendo like i wanted to but all of our floodplain in here we should be planting the correct trees and making lots of tall grass prairie in in there so i went, went to a nice prairie a uh, wildflower yard look a lot better than, than grass. So I'll end there so we had time for, for qu questions and for you to actually look at some of the things up here. So. Yeah, the, the question was, was why the raccoons have uh, remained abundant up, up to this point, point in time, whereas the, all the other large predators, the panther, the, the bears, uh, uh, bobcats, went out. Two, two reasons. One, one is body size. When you get large car carnivores, the larger they are, it's going to take a, a huge amount of land to provide enough food to, to support the metabolism. So raccoons are quite, quite smaller, so uh, they're not going to require as large a territory. The second reason is that they are very good omnivores, meaning they can eat about anything. And so. Uh, they, they pr did decrease in numbers, but human behavior, since most of us don't live on farms anymore, most people live in towns, and humans today generate a tremendous amount of trash, and we put the dog food and cat food on the porch for our pets, and the raccoons thank you for that. So, uh, <laughs> Oh yes. Um, what he's asking is is what what are what's the current status of of resurrecting a lot of the old wi wildlife. Um, so the Division of Wildlife through Ohio Department of Natural Resources has, has been very active in this since the uh, late 70s and early 80s. I served on the advisory committee for eight years uh, at that point in time. Um, but the biggest problem is lack of funding, uh, there's a tension between uh, the com commercial interests for logging, for even trapping of bobcats, which was a, a, a serious consideration uh, uh, by the wildlife people until a massive underswell of opposition, especially from the Athens area, mm -hmm. defeated that. Uh, but let me count the success stories. When I uh, first moved to Ohio in 1979, there was only, I think, 14 or 15 bald eagles in the entire state. And now they number in uh, upper hundreds, I've lost count, but they're, they're nesting in almost all, all the counties. Peregrine falcons have been brought back. 
bears have, have started to come back in naturally from West Virginia, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. So uh, that has not been an active reintroduction. River otters were completely trapped out for over 100 years, and they were brought in in the early 80s and are found throughout the state. So quite a, quite a. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, the quite question is about wild turkeys. Uh, turkeys were hunted out. Uh, the loss of the chestnut trees due to a a blight that happened in the 1904 and spread throughout, killed all the trees. Really kind of was the coup de grace of wiping out wild turkeys. Um, there's counter evidence. Some say that some migrated in into the southern counties from Kentucky, but most of the wild turkey introduction happened out at Waterloo Wildlife. Uh, Bob Donahoe was the, the, the key person doing that in the 1950s. And so they, he would, cap, would raise them in cages and then release them in different areas, but they, they weren't as successful as going to another state when they went to places like Arkansas and Oklahoma and trapped adults and brought them in. So a combination of all that, they eventually came back. Um, <laughs> let's answer that one, one first. The, um, go all the way down East State Street. There used to be a, uh, the, the qu question was, what, why did I have a slide about Menards? Menards is a big, gigantic um, um, hardware and everything else that you might want to buy for your house. It's um, even more, bigger than Lowe's. But they're planning to build a Menards in the area towards the end of East State Street. There was the, the uh, Athens Tree Commission. We actually have a tree commission that if any development takes place and trees are cut down, the trees need to be replaced. And where Menards is going to go is floodplain. The only natural trees that would be there without human intervention or with the cottonwoods, the box elders, and sycamore trees. Uh, initially, the Tree Commission told Menards that they had to plant 700 trees on their property, which would leave them no room to build a building. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. And when I read that a, a year or two ago, I, I was just kind of steaming and said, plant prairie grasses, prairie grasses down there and make it more, more natural. Uh, and so since then, they've, they've negotiated the number of trees down, but half of the town is floodplain prairie habitat originally. This building is sitting in the middle of where Hawking River used to flow. All that flat area out there should be tall grass prairie with all the beautiful wildflowers. Uh, so that was my point there. Se second, second question was, yeah. Bobcats, Bobcats. Um, what's the current status? I will decline an answer and ask Dr. Papascu to answer. <laughs> For real, we need an answer. What? Did, did the state officially lower it from endangered to threatened, or have they not dare do that? They're not listed anymore. Okay, I thought so.
Oh, <laughs> quite question is why why the spade foots? Why so many of them are moving all at once? Uh, the the proper type of habitat that they live in is our sandy gravel terraces, and that's that's a fairly rare habitat to be found. So the populations are concentrated and. They, I mean, the, the numbers can be staggering. It's amazing. I've, I've, I've been on the Muskingum River watching them just kind of pouring out of the woods, <laughs> going down to one of these temporary pools. They don't, they don't breed in bodies of water that will remain uh, with water for more than two weeks. <clears throat> so it's not permanent lakes or ponds. They don't live there. They're out-competed by other frogs. Um, but yeah, they're very, very dense pop populations. And when, and, but they only breed maybe once every three, four years because it requires flood conditions. And then they all come out. Last four more questions. Scott, Scott, up on the ridges uh, in the spring, I noticed that most we see these vultures. Uh, I don't know what kind they are, but the question is, what are they? They're beautiful, actually. <laughs> Then were they back in the uh, 1780s? <clears throat> yes. Um, question is about how, how many of you have seen these big black birds down along, along the riverbanks, soaring over Athens? Uh, we've got two species here. One's a turkey vulture, and doesn't look anything like a turkey. It's got a reddish head. And the other one is a black vulture. Uh, we've kept very good records of both species in the area dating back to 1947 and turkey vultures are always here. They're here in the summer, they're here in the winter. Uh, they particularly like Athens because if you look at the map, Athens is on this north-south ridge. The Hawking River makes a perfect uh, 180 degree turn around the peninsula of Athens. And so all the woods up on that ridge in the morning time, the air warms up and develops thermals and those turkey vultures can climb up and, and go off into the countryside looking for deer that we've run into on the roads. Um, so they've always been here. The black vulture is a southern species very, very, con if you travel to uh, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, you see them all the time. We started seeing the black vulture, oh, what year is he? It was the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, that two or three pairs would be nesting up uh, by Lancaster. And slowly the population started rising and rising. In the last 10 years, they're almost equal in number of turkey vultures. So the black vulture is darker, it's got a shorter tail, and, and that doesn't soar as well. So when it takes off, it's got to flap its wings real hard, and then we'll try to soar for 20 feet or so. Flap, flap, flap. Very distinctive uh, flapping. And so you can easily tell them apart. The black vulture, unfortunately, isn't 100% scavenger like the turkey vulture. And so it is an agricultural pest. And so any farmer in the springtime when cows are dropping calves, the, if, if several black vultures uh, get right up on a newborn calf, they can kill it and eat it. They're mainly going after the, the afterbirth, the placenta, the, uh, which is good, good food. But, uh, but they've, they've def their whole range has moved a good several degrees um, latitude just in the last 40 years. And it's due to what politicians claim doesn't exist. <laughs>
Okay, with that, we will end the formal session tonight. I know that Dr. Moody would love you to come up and talk more if you have questions. And look at all of the wonderful things that he's come up for this place. Next week is a cafe conversation. Two weeks, another science cafe. But let's give Dr. Moody a round.